Okay. If you're in a helicopter in the Old Testament and you're hanging out where Moses is out with the children of Israel and they erect a temple everywhere they stop, you're looking, at the, you're looking down on it. That's the floor plan, okay? What's this part? And then when Jesus died, he tore that veil and said that we are the temple. So the outer court is the same thing as the soul. What's in the soul? Spirit. When you get saved, where does the Lord live? Where does he live? Holy of Holies. lives in the spirit realm. More times than not, when we are afflicted or demonized by the devil, where does he live? In the body. How many of that, that's brand new theology for you? How many of you have seen that before? How many of you got it here? How many of you got it elsewhere? How many didn't vote? I just want to give you an opportunity to raise your hand. Hallelujah. Let me do this before we start. No. <laughs> Lesson learned. I ain't doing that again. Father, I stand in the authority and the anointing that you placed on my life as I arrest every spirit that does not submit to Jesus, that does not fly his banner. I render you paralyzed right now by the name of the shed blood of Jesus. You will not interfere. You will not run. You will not cause distraction. You will not attempt to even interfere with those that are afflicted by you. I return to you sleep paralysis. So you can see, you can hear, but you can't talk and you can't move. In the mighty name of Jesus. And Holy Spirit, I ask you to come right now in great power and that you would, you would give divine instruction, wisdom, confidence, and peace to those that are in desperate need of your touch. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said. Amen. For those that are un, not used to me at all, I was not saying that you are functioning in sleep paralysis. I was speaking to the devil that he functions in sleep paralysis because I want him to see, hear, and experience everything. I just don't want him to be able to respond. Do things a little bit differently today. All right, who's got your Bibles? Let me see them. Physical Bibles, hold them up. Hold them up, hold them up, hold them up, hold them up. All right, electronic Bibles, let me see those. Good job, guys. Good job. Turn with me, please, to the book of Luke, chapter 13. I happen to like that graphic. For those of you that are wondering what that number five is in the bottom corner, that's how many logos, including the one that you normally see on the bottom left, that's how many logos are in that graphic. So if you're at work and you're bored and you just want to see where's Waldo, that's how you do it right there. There's, there's four other ones that you can't see easily, but they're there. I feel like I'm, I'm just going head on with theology that has been taught that says that when you get forgiven of your sins, then the bondages are also removed with the covering of the sin. And I'm going to show you biblically that, that is, that's, a, that's a false doctrine. It's not true. It doesn't work that way. And so that's why you have believers who have surrendered and given their lives to Jesus, 
but yet still have all kinds of habits and compulsions and thought lives and, and anger issues and road rage and all kinds of messes still going on in their life because the bondage is still there. Salvation came, but the bondage didn't leave because of salvation. Salvation is something that you apply to every area of your life. So how many's ever had, you know, squeaky uh, uh, door hinges, not door, what do you call them? What do you call them on the garage doors? Rollers. Wake up, man, I'm going to tell you right now. So when your garage door goes up and you hear squeak, 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 well, you just don't go, go, go get the lithium thing and shoot one wheel and go, the garage door's fixed. No, there's a bunch of wheels on that thing, right? And so rather than miss, watch this, rather than just trying to hit only the squeaky ones, you hit them all. Because even if they're not squeaking, they're a potential squeak. This is what we do with salvation. That's why the Bible says salvation comes from the word so-so, which means every aspect of our life and being. What we tend to do is we want salvation. Lord, cleanse my spirit so that when you come back, I go with you. And that's great, but that doesn't help the body who's still bound up with all kinds of compulsions and issues. So we got to take that same salvation that we receive for our spirit and now start applying it to the areas of our life that God reveals. Does that make sense? Luke chapter 13, verse 10. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the temples, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. <laughs> Let me not just skim over that. And a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit. This is an intentional thing. And that booger had, a, had access to her life for 18 long years. She was bent over double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. He didn't say sin. He said infirmity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. Can I just say it like this? There are people in your life that will not celebrate your freedom. They won't. You, you get healed, well, the wrong minister prayed for you. It was the wrong day. You went to the wrong church. It was the wrong blah, blah, blah. Right? So the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, a daughter of what? A daughter of what? A daughter of what? Whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years be set free on the Sabbath from what bound her. And when he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted at the wonderful things that he was doing. So there really are two kingdoms. This is not something that we, that we say just to make things overly simplistic. It's not something that we say uh, just to get you to do or act in a certain way. It, it's, it's a fact, Jack. There's two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of, of Satan. God, obviously, is supernatural. And he causes us, believers, those whose spirit has been reborn to also function in the supernatural. Oh, Jesus, help me right now. So watch this. You cannot serve a supernatural God and not also walk in the supernatural. I want to say that again. You cannot serve a supernatural God and not also walk in the supernatural. Just like you can't serve the devil and not simultaneously serve and or function in witchcraft. You cannot serve as the cook at Ruby's, Rudy's, Rudy's barbecue and not smell like the barbecue with which you work. It's the truth. So if you have been regenerated by the Spirit of God and become a new creation, then should you not, as the Bible says, walk even as he walked? Do 
what it was he did? Got too many people saying with their mouth, I serve a supernatural God. And they function in the opposite. We'll say that. Just like there's people who are married but live as though they're not. They want to act single. Go to the singles group. Go to singles events. Play on dating apps. And if you knew that about them, you'd say, listen, why are you living this way and purporting to be this way? That's how we ought to be with each other that say that we're loving and serving Jesus. If you say you're married to Jesus, then why in the world are you acting single? It's estimated today that over 12 million Americans are addicted to witchcraft of some kind. 12 million Americans, and I imagine that's on the rise. Matthew 16, verse 18. It says, and I tell you, you are Peter. And I will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell shall not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind, which is to declare to be improper and unlawful on earth. Oh, God, help me right now. Whatever you bind, declare to be improper and unlawful on earth must be what is already bound in heaven. And whatever you loose or declare is lawful on earth must be what is already loosed in heaven. That's why I could do what I just did in the preglow. I could bind the works of the enemy. Why? Because they're already bound in heaven. And because I'm supernatural, serving a supernatural God, I can have supernatural activity that demands the resignation of the enemy who's functioning in opposition to what thus saith the Lord is. Does that make sense? It says the gates of hell... To my knowledge, that's only found once in in the Bible. And here, Jesus is referring to his church for the first time, as well as the building of his church. He's not yet yet left. And he's speaking to the church that he's establishing. And that church comes from the word ecclesia, which means called out or an assembly. So the church, in our understanding of the definition, is the assembly of people who have been called out of the world by the gospel. Not people that attend, but people that assemble. You go, what's the difference? You attended school, but you assemble as the body of Christ. There's something supernatural that really does happen when we, when we decide to obey the word when it says, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together. How many ever watched Transformers? There really is something supernatural that happens as the pieces of the body come together. All of a sudden, there's a snap, snap, click, click, engage. All the, we, we become something together that we're not alone. See, the enemy wants us to be isolated and encapsulated even in a group such as this. He wants us to live in a proverbial bubble so that I can sit next to Cameron, but he ain't having no effect on me, and I ain't having no effect on him. We just There's a line. It's kind of like when I like to go out to eat sometimes with, with the people of this church, and, and I'm happy to sit, sit on the where two tables come together, and I'll let them know, see that line? Don't cross it. <laughs> I'm sitting next to you, but I am not eating with you. You understand what I'm saying? I, this, is, this is my food. We treat that. We treat that same mentality here when we come to church. In fact, we almost congratulate ourselves if we can come in a little bit late, sit close to the back, 
not have anybody touch us, greet us, hug us, you know, anything. And then right before the real ministry takes place, book it for the door so we have no conviction. We have, we have no, we're not getting all of our mess out for other people to see. And it's like, whew, I've been to church. No, you attended. The church has got to get back to what it means to assemble. Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. And he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue, as was his custom. <laughs> I love this. Man, the church of the, of the Bible times was they gathered in houses and you know, they broke bread. And yeah, that's a piece of it. That's a piece of it. Did you guys read what I just read here? He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue as was his custom. He went to church as was his he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And unrolling it, he found a place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I heard a message just recently that talked about this passage and said in the temple for 400 years, there was a chair that was designated and set aside for the Messiah to sit on. Nobody else could, no, no person, no individual had ever sat on that chair for 400 years until this. So you can imagine all the oxygen in the room when Jesus went up there and he sat down. <laughs> What do you think he's doing? And bring me the scroll. The reason he read out of Isaiah 61 is because that was the scripture that was designated and assigned and set aside for whoever was to come and sit in that chair. That was free. Deliverance must be preached. Deliverance does, it's just not something that just happens. It has to be preached. People must hear about it and make the choice to be set free. That's why freedom is intentional. Freedom is not something accidental. I want to say it like this. There are some people that come to church because it's the only peace they get. They're tormented at home. They're tormented in their marriage. They're tormented on the job. They're tormented in their mind. They're tormented in their dreams. They're tormented. Everywhere they go, they're tormented. And they will come into church because they could just, oh. You say, well, how does that happen? The Bible says the Lord is the Spirit. Oh. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is, there is, there is. So you have people that come to where the presence is, and they experience. So when people come and you see them relaxing. Now, I've seen people that have come high and drugged and all that kind of stuff. They'll pass out because they're just drug dumb, right? But I've also seen those that have come in that the only peace that they have in their life is when they're in the presence of God. And their body is so rejoicing in the fact that there's peace that it just... <gasps> Why? It, it, it's, like, it's like living with a newborn. I swear newborns have a programming, right? You're rocking in your chair, you go, oh. They know. I've come to a point to understand that even if somebody's body is sleeping, their spirit is not. So I can speak the word of God to the spirit of the person and make a deposit that their body's too stupid to know I did. <laughs> the word of God is spirit. It is spirit food. 
Psalm 107, verse 15. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. When do they cry to the Lord? How many of you get sick of people that only call you when they're in a mess? But this says they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness, the utter darkness, and broke away their chains. He let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind, for he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. See, spiritual warfare makes a lot of people uncomfortable, especially people that didn't grow up in church. Who did not grow up in church? Hold it up high. Hold it up high. You did not grow up in church. I applaud you for being here. How many of you grew up in church as a kid and then got away from it? Hold it up high. Let me say something to you. You might have been singing deep and wide, deep and wide, and I'm in the Lord's army. What you didn't understand is God was setting a hook in your life. So even though you got away from him, here we are in 2024 and God says, come on, just a little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer. You never discount what's happening in children's church. God can set a hook in there just like he can in an adult. There's a lot of believers that don't believe that there's such a thing as spiritual warfare. In fact, they want to avoid the subject at all costs, in part maybe because of fear of being ridiculed. Watch this. In part because of retaliation from evil forces. Huh? I'm sorry. That's, that's kind of the definition of spiritual warfare. <laughs> Just me thinking out loud. Okay, and then number three, they, they, they don't want to bring undue attention to the subject. They don't want to glorify something that they don't believe really is, is true. I struggle with that theology because why would Ephesians 6 tell us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not physical, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds? Why would we have weapons of war if we were not intended to use weapons in war? You want to know how I know that they do believe in spiritual warfare? The Bible says... That the word of God is a sword. And when you're not fighting the devil, what you'll say is, that's not what the word says. No, it's not. No, no. And we fight each other with the sword instead of fighting the devil. Is it any less war when we're sticking each other instead of sticking the enemy? No. War is war. This is a weapon. Don't get it twisted. Y'all thought I was going to hit her. Saw some of your faces like. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. Here's that scripture I just quoted. Of course, I said it was Ephesians. It's not 2 Corinthians. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know what that last part, verse 5, tells me? That even thoughts are a part of warfare. It is no less war to fight the way someone thinks than it is to fight the devil directly. I think you've seen enough cop shows and movies and whatnot to see people that, that have left little bombs and trip wires and, and all that kind of stuff. The enemy likes to have us have conversations that leave little trip wires in our life. So he'll plant them and run, and then we're home. Watch this. Not connected, just at home, hanging out. And we'll see or hear something that triggers a memory, and that memory takes us down this little track that goes to this trip wire that if we are not totally convinced of who Jesus is on the inside of us, that tripwire will detonate and blow us to bits. The enemy does not fight fair. He doesn't just come up and say, oh, come on, you and me right now, let's go. He, he's, he's not even into that. What he'd like to do is just plant little bombs in your life that you're going you know, to you're gonna, you're gonna trip on or step on or, or activate 
He'll even, if you're, if you're dancing all around it and then not touching it, he'll even send somebody into your life that will address that topic and cause you to run right into it. Spiritual warfare is a real thing. I've taught this before, but I'm going to say it here again because it fits. God and the devil can do nothing on earth unless they use a body. Matthew eleven twelve 12 says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. That verse has messed with me for a lot of years because you can look at that a number of different ways. The kingdom of heaven that God has established has suffered violence because the enemy keeps coming against the gates of heaven. Now, they, they'll never prevail. But the kingdom of heaven does suffer violence. So you have somebody on the outside who wants to get what heaven releases. But you got to know that there's devils that want to stand between you and the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. But the violent take the kingdom of heaven by force, which means I have to get through all this mess and reach out to the kingdom that gives me access. Now watch this. What is the way to access the kingdom? The cross of Jesus becomes a bridge, becomes a battering ram, becomes whatever's necessary in order to get us through what we're dealing with to the kingdom. Do you follow what I'm saying? We have too many people expecting the kingdom just to come to them. Just, I'll sit here and wait on it. Lord, you bring it. There's things in my life that I want, but I know that I'm going to have to work to get them. So God will empower me to do the work necessary in order to access that that my heart desires. If you desire God, work for him. If you desire being a part of the kingdom, work for it. Got too many people that have this entitled mentality that, well, when the Lord's ready, he'll bring it to me. He did. His name is Jesus. He made the way. Now use the way that he made, but don't expect that it's going to be clear of obstruction. How many has ever been to the doctor? Dare I say, who's not been to the doctor? There you go. When you're filling out that paperwork, what are they asking you for? What kind of information? Huh? Family. Now watch this. They're asking for family information. They want to know who in your family line had cancer, emphysema, COPD, diabetes, heart disease. You want to know the truth, what they're looking for, that they don't know that they're looking for? They're looking for familiar spirits because the spirits that have afflicted the family in times past is staying in the family line. So instead of dealing with the spiritual aspect, they're dealing with medicating the the wake of what the enemy has left. So when you go through and you're identifying all that, you need to understand you're also identifying how the enemy has afflicted and attacked your family in times past. I'm just letting that sink in a minute. What are familiar spirits? It's spirits that got familiar with your family. Great-great-grandpa was a violent man. He was a drunk. I'm making this up. He beat people for fun. And you look back at your great-grandfather and then your grandfather and then your daddy, and then you, and you're wondering why you're always looking to pick a fight with somebody. Why is that? Familiar spirit. And he jumped on the generational train.
He goes, I just don't believe that. Really? Then explain to me why diabetes runs in families, heart disease runs in families, mental illness runs in families. Explain that to me. Addictions run in families. Why? Familiar spirits. Why also does the anointing run in families? Why is there a greater anointing each generation that comes along? If, if they will submit to it, why? Why is that there? And somebody will say, well, I don't have anybody in my family lined up. We don't know how far back your family line there was that somebody really loved Jesus. And that might be on hold waiting on you to say yes to God so he can go back 10 generations ago. Listen, the, the familiar spirit got a hold 10 generations ago, but that 11th one loved me. So let me bring those blessings because I haven't forgotten. You might not have records for that, but I know what they did. And what if there wasn't any in your whole line? What are you going to do when you stand before God? Well, I'm sorry, but there was nobody to pass anything down to me. How about you be the first? You don't think there's a supernatural blessing for being the first one to draw a line in the sand with the blood in the name of the Yeshua Hamashiach and say, hey, that is with me. Our adversary operates in different levels of authority. You can find that in Ephesians 6. Principalities is one of those. How many has ever heard that term before, principalities? Principalities are high-level chief rulers in the atmosphere who represent Satan's kingdom as princes. In the Greek, it's arche which means chief ruler. Principalities are ruling demonic spirits or devils possessing executive authority or governmental rule in the world over specific territories and regions. Could be a particular nation, people, race, all kinds of things. Oh. Let me just make this really practical. We're in a neighborhood that regardless of how many churches are here, the territory really is not ruled by God. And if you don't believe that, come hang out with me tonight until around, I don't know, midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning, and hear the nonsense that's happening just in the surrounding streets. You really don't have to wait that late, about 10 p.m. on. Okay? Now watch this. You don't know how many times I've picked up needles, joints, Powdery substances that's left on our porch. Tin foil. If I gotta spill this out for some of you, then we'll just talk after class. Just around the property. Why? Because the territory is ruled by the enemy. But you want to know why the guy that was out there trying to curse the church didn't work? Because there's also an angelic host that has authority over this property. You want to know why? Because we've taken this for Jesus. Now, we've got to expand our borders throughout the neighborhood. I don't want to be satisfied with the fact that he couldn't get on the property. I want to physically go out there and grab the border and just <laughs> go out about 10 blocks. You know what I'm saying? New rules, new border. <laughs> Guys, listen, years ago when, when, Cameron, when Cameron was alive, we were just down the street at 59, no, 44th, 44th and Penn. I've told some of you this before. Some of y'all are new, so I get to say it again. And we were installing cameras, and the sun was just barely starting to go down. It was just where the weather was getting kind of nice. And typically, we'd work till after dark because we don't like to have to come back. We want to get it done. And he looked at me and said, Joel, we got to get out of here. I said, well, I mean, you got a hot date? I mean, what's up? He said, no, we really got to go. Makes sense to me, Cameron, what's going on? He said, I don't know. I got something in my belly. We got to go. And I said, say no more. We threw everything in the truck right then and there, booked it. An hour later, there was a gun battle right there where we were at. If you've been watching the news, then you recognize that 59th and Agnew, they had an event center, 12 people shot, one dead. 
Oh, yeah, Halloween party. We've got to expand our borders. We've gotten too confident and comfortable saying that we're all going to go to hell, but as long as we're okay here in our little boat, we've got to grow the boat. If the boat is not a ship, if the boat does not rival Carnival, we're doing a bad job. Thank you, Laura. Then there's powers. The Greek word for powers is exousia. It's derived or conferred authority from principalities. So principalities are up there, and then they release authority to powers. That's where we find terrorism, violence, poverty, drug abuse, disease, crime, prejudice, homosexuality, etc., etc., etc. Then underneath powers is rulers, rulers of darkness of this world. They're associated with idolatry, pagan gods, witchcraft, magic, voodoo, demonic practices, spiritual blindness, etc., etc., etc. Then there's spiritual wickedness in high places. The spiritual wickedness in high places is, is demonic entities that influence lawmakers and those that are in authority to make laws, watch this, that hinder worship, that hinder the, the assembling of the believers together. You hear anything I'm saying? So that's why it's important that we pray who's in office, and not that we just pray that God would do that, but that we also be empowered by our own faith, because faith without works is dead, and we register to vote, and we go to the voting booth, and we vote for the most godly uh, uh, influence that we have for our nation and our government. Can I say it like this? Please don't pray and ask God to put godly leadership in while you do not participate with him to do the same. And in fact, by not participating with him, you are in essence participating against him. I heard a message just recently. A friend of mine texted me, did an outstanding job on talking about why this is right for the body of Christ. I may do that. I may interject that in our deliverance month. Because we got to get this out before November 5th. I'm not going to chase that bunny. Not right now. The enemy likes to exercise rights over us or authority over us through three types of curses. The first one is the universal curse, and that's sin. If you're functioning in sin, you're opening the door to curses to function in your life. Okay? The second one is a generational curse. What is that? That's ancestral sin that's passed down to the familiar spirits. If you guys remember the story in 2 Kings chapter 5 of, of Elisha and Gehazi, what happened when Gehazi was found out? When Elisha said, did, not, did my spirit not go down with you when you talked to him about those clothes? He got leprosy. Who else got leprosy? His whole family line. Oh, God help me right now. You catch that? Gehazi got leprosy because he fought against the anointing of God, and yet his whole family got it. Why? Familiar spirit. That's the way it works. The third one is a personal curse. That's individual sin like Ananias and Sapphira did. Then there's witchcraft curses. That's curses that are placed on us by witches, by those involved in the occult. Then there is people that are not necessarily witches. Oh, let me back up a half step. How many have ever been to an unscrupulous mechanic? An unscrupulous mechanic, a dishonest mechanic. So you go and say, listen, my oil's really low. Well, that's because you went 15,000 miles without an oil change. That wasn't his fault. So he says, okay. So he gives you an oil change, sends you down the road. A few weeks, your oil's low again. So you go back to the mechanic. Hey, oil's low. 
man, okay, now I'm not sure what's going on. Let me fix that. So he puts another oil change on it, sends you out the, out the door. Three weeks later, guess what? So you get a little suspicious about the third, fourth, fifth time. So you take it to another mechanic. And they say, oh, they've been putting the wrong filter on your car. It doesn't fit properly, so it's constantly leaking. Here's the reason I'm saying this. I have known of people that had demonic activity in their home. And instead of running to Jesus, they ran to witchcraft books, sage, uh, palmistry, all kinds of stuff. And all of a sudden, that demonic activity seemed to stop. Why is that? Because you're dealing with a dishonest mechanic. So what they're doing is they're tricking you to think that witchcraft stops demonic activity. So you run to witchcraft to get rid of the demonic activity so the demonic activity stops you. go, woo! All right! What does that do? That opens you up to more because if that worked on that, what else might they have that will work on? The devil's a deceiver. I'm looking around the room and some of y'all going, So that's witchcraft. Then there's curses by people that are not witches. We call it charismatic witchcraft. And this is why I caution you on how you pray. You got to be very careful how you pray. Remember when Israel cried out, we want a king, we want a king, we want to be like everybody else, Lord, give us a king. So he gave them Saul. Is Saul who they needed? But is that who they got? And they got it, why? I have learned Unless God specifically speaks to me and says, I want this person in office now, I've got to be careful how I pray. I see big question marks on some of you. Let me put it like this. I'm totally making this up. But it bears thinking about what if Joe Biden got it to teach America a lesson because we wouldn't listen when it wasn't the way it was before Joe Biden got it? I'm dancing, y'all. I'm trying to avoid landmines. What if? We see in Scripture time and time again where God gave people the type of leader, not that they necessarily needed, but one that would bring them back to so you have to ask God, who do you want? And in the absence of hearing who he says, then you vote your best conscience. Because I don't want to fight God. And I don't want to release charismatic witchcraft because I'm praying something that is diametrically opposed to what God has designed for us to have right now. Y'all ain't hearing anything I'm saying. I just, I just absolutely put some of your belief systems in a blender and put it on high. Then there's some self-imposed curses. I, 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 get, I get on to people. I'm just so stupid. And I go, what'd you just say? Where'd that come from? I know that didn't come from Scripture. We say the dumbest things about, I'll just never get promoted. Nobody will ever want to marry me. I'm surprised my car's lasted this long. All this stuff. And I, I, I'm sitting here thinking, my goodness, you, you got to remember words are uber that releases either destructive force or a creative force. And I'm sitting here thinking, how many of these time bombs are we placing in our own life?
Some good news. You need to understand the devil is limited. He's a fallen angel. He is not equal to God. He definitely has limitations. He is not omnipotent, which is all powerful. He's not omniscient, which is all knowing. He's not omnipresent, all places at once. He is unaware of the thoughts of your mind. See, some of you are not convinced of that because you're sitting here thinking about something, and all of a sudden somebody says something. <gasps> the devil must be reading my thoughts. No. The devil planted that thought in you. And then planted that thought in somebody else and said, why don't you say that so that you think the devil read your mind? He didn't read your mind. He just called out the very thought he planted in yours. But discernment in your life is broken, so you didn't recognize it came from the devil. So, oh, the devil can read my mind. No, he cannot read your mind. He's not creator. He doesn't know how the algorithms work in your head. He doesn't do that. I can just hear some of y'all saying, well, what about this AI stuff that, you know, you're putting the ear pods in now and the ear pods and they're saying that it can read your brain waves. And Here's what they're doing. It, it's, it's like putting a wristband on you to watch your pulse. So if somebody says something mean to you and your pulse spikes and they know, oh, that made you mad. So they're watching signs and symptoms. They're not reading thoughts. But the difference now is technology is listening to the very things that spiked your blood pressure. So now the devil's taking notes going, okay, if you say this, that's going to make them mad. If you say that, that's going to make If you say this, they'll really like that. Let's scrap that one out. Let's they say this. So they're taking notes. They're studying you. It doesn't mean they can read your mind. Now watch this. The enemy also likes to watch where your eyes go. So you think, well, he can't read my mind, so he doesn't know what I'm thinking. But he can see what your blood pressure's doing, what your attitude's like, and where your eyeballs go at the same time. And he can make, he can draw some pretty good lines. We've been offering so much information. Why do you think that God don't give us, except when it's time to interpret tongues, why God does not always tell us what tongues is saying? Because we would undo the very thing that we're praying if we knew what it said. That's why there's only certain opportune times where God will give you interpretation of tongues because that he wants you to you want your faith to rise and get in agreement with what he just said. But many times we're saying stuff that we, if we knew what we were saying, we'd stop praying in tongues because we're freaked out by it. I think it was my son that was telling me about one of the illustrations where somebody was praying in tongues and God said, fine, I'm going to send you to so-and-so and such and such. I said, Lord, I, I, I don't want to do that. Why would you send me there? And he says, well, you prayed for it. When, Lord, did I ever pray that? He said, well, you prayed in tongues last week. Because you're praying the will of God, not your own will. See, too often, oh, yes, I'm going to say it like that. Too often we, we engage in witchcraft prayers because we're praying our will instead of God's will. How many times is our will in opposition to God's will? Probably a lion's share of the time. <laughs> oh. So Satan is limited. The mighty weapons for spiritual warfare are the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus. Let me pause here. I just had somebody, a friend of mine, send me said, listen, they're saying that Jesus isn't really his name and that it's, it's kind of a combination of other words and da-da-da-da-da and the meaning and blah, 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 the interpretations. And let, let me just say it like this. I have watched too many devils run in terror at the name of Jesus for God to not honor the speaking and the evoking of that name. I thank God for deliverance because that, that has sealed some things in my life that probably would not be sealed in my life had deliverance, A, not come, and B, not function from. Okay? I'll save that for another time because there's a whole lot more we get into there, but I don't want to get too sidetracked. So the blood in the name of Jesus, the word of God mixed with faith. You say, well, the word of God by itself should be able to do it. Speak to this mountain and doubt not in your heart. If there's no doubt, what are you mixing it with? Faith. The blood, the name, the word, the Holy Spirit. Praise and worship. Prayer and intercession. And watch this. The fellowship of the saints. You know how many times guys show up to the men's meet 
And you can tell when they walk in, it looks like they just lost their favorite dog. I mean, they're kicking the cans and rocks and, you know, just, just kind of down. And by the time the men's meet's over, their belly's full, they're laughing, they're cutting up, they're swapping numbers, they're talking about cars and bikes and, and jobs and money and all this kind of stuff. And all, Why? Because fellowship does something. It meets a need in our life that God created for us to, to, to fulfill in one another. Fellowship is a needful thing. So Satan's power is limited. We have mighty weapons. And the third thing is we fight from a position of victory. Stop fighting from defeatism. Greater is he that's in me than he that's within the world. The victor cannot be defeated just because of whose house he's in. My job is to release the victor through me to be who I can't be by myself. If you're taking notes, I'm going to talk fast. Just some examples of, of, the, of the demonic realm attacking the church in the New Testament. Acts 8, the Simon, uh, Simon the sorcerer. Acts 13, Elimus the sorcerer. Acts 16, the young girl from Philipp in Philippi who was running behind Paul. Make way, make way, the man of God. That one. In Acts 19, the sons of Sceva. In Mark chapter 4 and 5, Jesus and the demoniac of the Gadarene. Can I say it like this? If you truly love Jesus and you're sold out to Jesus, the devil cannot come and fight you without it offending me. So y'all would understand it if I said, if somebody picks up my daughter, prepare to meet Jesus. You would understand, oh, well, yeah, I mean, they're family. I mean, I get that. You know, dad's got to protect. And, but I'm, I'm telling you that in the, in the supernatural as well, that when the enemy is messing with you, we're no less family. Yeah, I got about six of you going, yeah, hey, man, that's, that's a good point. The rest of you going, whatever. That's why when it comes to deliverance, it's, it's why I fight the way I fight. Sometimes I get very angry, not at you, but at the enemy who has lied to you, betrayed you, convinced you of falsehoods. You really can be delivered from sin, but not bondage. I'll say it again, you can be delivered from sin, but not bondage. I mean simultaneously. Christians cannot be demon-possessed. But they can be demonized. They cannot be demon-possessed. But they can be oppressed. Jesus never performed miracles just to excite people. His miracles will always serve to bring glory to God and to meet the needs of the people. The one with the issue of blood that we started off with in Luke 13, in verse 16, it says she was a daughter of Abraham. What does that mean? That means she had a covenant relationship with God, and yet she still struggled with 18 years with a blood disorder. Also in verse 16 says, whom, whom Satan hath kept bound for 18 long years. She was Satan bound, bound by Satan. Give me a volunteer. Come here, Mark. I'm going to pick on you. Come here. If you haven't yet met Mark and Mitzi, you need to do that. Hold your arms out. I didn't want to rip your arm hair out, or I would have. (laughs) 
Maybe Mark is the wrong one. He probably could break this. I, I got to go a little extra. <laughs> if you maybe look bad, I have some mule tape in the back, and I know you ain't breaking that. This is, this is way too close to handcuffs. <laughs> now watch this. How has ever given somebody permission to drive your car? How many of you, after giving said permission, they called you and said, I am so sorry. They had an accident in your car. Come on, hold it up. When you brought it back and offered your apology, and I'm going to take it for the sake of argument, that they gave their forgiveness. Because you were forgiven, did it make the car fixed? So when you live in sin that causes one to be bound and you come to the Lord and say, Lord, please forgive me for the sin that brought bondage in my life. The Lord says, fine, blood washed and forgiven. Does that mean that the bondage is now gone? No. Now enter deliverance. When Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus, and as he took all the criticism from family members saying, if you had just been here, I called you early and you came late. And he said, move the stone. And using supernatural words, he said, Lazarus, come forth. He was dead. Now he's alive. Oh, we were once dead in sin and trespasses, yet we came to Jesus and now we're alive to him. So once we were dead, now we're alive. And so he's, he speaks to us and life comes in and now we're walking around like this. Why? Jesus did said to those who were standing around, he said, go and loose him of his, bo his bonds. Because he was dead, now alive, now release him. So people coming to know Jesus, and we stand up and say, listen, I want to give my life to Jesus. Yes, let's pray the prayer. Let's, let's confess with our mouth, believe in our heart. Yes, let's be regenerated on the inside and become a new. Yes. But when you leave after salvation, you're still going to eat with us like this. Why? Because the effects of what you had in your life has not magically gone because you came alive. But now that you are alive, there needs to be people in, our li in, in your life and my life that God can speak to and say, hey, go release them. Deliverance is our job. So when you see a brother or sister that's tore up in their faith, our job is to say, man, I'm so glad you're alive in Jesus, but I see you really jacked up there. If you'd let me, I'll, I'll walk you through how to get rid of this, and we'll just rip this to pieces. Does that make sense? I'm not going to cut you. This is good tape. All right, now break it. Thank you, Mark, very, very much. I'll give it for Mark. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes not but for what? To kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus said, but I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. So why do we walk around confessing and talking about how we're bound up, dead on the inside, worried and anxious and fearful? And Why is that our discussion instead of talking about how we are who God made us, full of life and having life to the full? Where's that discussion? I'm skipping. In verse 16 of Luke 13, he said, she ought to be loosed, but there were people in her life that did not want her free. Listen, there's a lot of people in your life that have no problem with you saying, Lord, save me, and you get saved on the inside, but they want you bound up, so you still hop to the bars with them, and you still hop for, you know, all this other, you still go with them to do stuff that bound people do. Does that make sense? All right, I'm tying a bow right here. So you note takers, scribble fast. Here are some steps that can help you receive and discover freedom from your past. How many of you have a past that you really would like to get severed from? 
Number one, you've got to recognize the curse. You've been going to the doctor's office and filling out family history and didn't realize that what you were, what you were doing is you were spiritually identifying generational things in your own life. You've got to identify the curses, recognize the curses. Number two, you've got to break them. It's not enough to know that they're there. You have to go after them. You have to break them. How do you break them? Give your life to Jesus, use spiritual warfare, and regain control over the power of your will. Number three, reverse the curse. How have we learned in the last two weeks to reverse the curse? What breaks the curse? Blessing. Who said blessing? 50 points. Good job. Number four, release the power of love. Well, I just love Jesus down deep in my soul. Don't tell me about the love you have down there if what's coming out of your well is not what you say is in it. Number five, we have to learn how to develop a godly attitude. Matthew 5.44 says that God sends the rain on the just and the unjust, but it's our attitude that determines whether or not the rain will water the seeds of our harvest or wash the seeds away. Rain's coming. Number six, make your words align with God's words. He's not saying you're stupid. He's not saying you're illegitimate. He's not saying you'll never mount anything. So you stop saying those things. Number seven, you have to accept God's acceptance. It's not enough for God to accept you if you're unwilling to receive it. Have you ever tried to hug somebody who didn't know how to receive it? Oh, hey, how you doing? Huh? They stand there like a bean pole, and not just a bean pole, but one that's leaning away from you, right? Because they don't, they don't know. Watch this. It's not just the act of the, the mechanics of what a hug is. It's not the fact they don't understand how to do this. It's the fact that they're not in agreement with the faith that says, I'm embracing you, so I would be lying on the outside. As a man thinketh on thee, so is he on the Lastly, once we've done all these things, we need to walk in obedience. You want to stay free? Walk in obedience. God is still in the healing business. I want you to hear this. God's power is not released or manifested because we have a need. That's not why God does that. He heals, mends, and restores because we have faith in his promises. Faith activates it. How many ever seen that glue that you, you put it on like gel or like water, and it stays wet until you add the blue light? And when you add the blue light, then it hardens. You understand what I'm saying? Faith is the blue light to the glue. So we're slapping glue in our life. God fixed this and God fixed that. And we're, we're gluing everything. But until we apply the blue light of our faith to that, In Mark 5, 25 to 34, when the woman touched the hem of Jesus' garment, that was a physical thing but had spiritual implications. This is a physical thing but it has spiritual implications. This is a physical thing but it has spiritual implications. This is a physical thing but it has spiritual implications. Mark 9, 23, Jesus said, if you can believe all things are possible to him that believes. Not most things, not almost all, but all things are. Here's a problem that a lot of people have that I've ministered to. They want to be free. They want to be free of the bondage. but they don't want to be free from their habits, desires, or relationships. So let me make a dividing line as I'm closing here. I need you to understand there's, some, there's certain things you've got to walk away from. Okay? 
when I married Rachel, there were, there were relationships I walked away from. Why? Because I didn't want any confusion on their part, my part, or on her part. And yet we got people saying that they're coming to Jesus and giving him the rest of their life. But they're unwilling to walk away from the alliances and relationships that will drag them far away from their loyalty and, and alliance with him. So you're going to have to be willing to remove anything from your house or your body that's cursed or forbidden. This can mean astrology charts, books, demonic pictures, statues, games, movies, jewelry, charms, bracelets, necklaces, body piercings. I hear some of you say, yeah, but I, this tattoo. Ever heard of this thing called laser removal? Or even a tat over. I have ministered to a number of people in times past that was wearing jewelry that I didn't even know, like had a necklace that was down here underneath their shirt and I had no clue. And the devil wouldn't go and I couldn't figure out why. Until at some point it was either revealed or I don't know. Somehow I found out that they're wearing this, this charm or this whatever. But, but, but Aunt so-and-so gave that to me right before she died. It doesn't really mean anything to me. I just think it's really pretty. You know, my, my first boyfriend and my first girlfriend gave that to me. I mean, I was in grade school. That, that, it doesn't mean anything. It was a gift. I don't care about the person that gave it. It's just worth a lot of money. Sell it. <laughs> Avoid negative talk about yourself and others. Pray daily. Pray daily and seek prayer and support from those that you have faith and trust in. So some things that I want to accomplish today is I want to start breaking some unholy alliances. You cannot be in the Lord's camp and in the devil's camp simultaneously. And there are some very unholy alliances that are going on that are called soul ties. How many's ever heard me teach on soul ties? How many's never heard me teach on soul ties? How many does not know what a soul tie is? Let me give you an example. Soul ties not only can, they necessarily do come with sexual contact. You cannot have sexual contact with another and it not come without soul ties. It's an impossibility. That can be consensual. It can be non-consensual. It can be rape, incest, group sex. I'm not trying to get overtly graphic. I just need you to understand there's no Sexual contact that does not come with an associated soul tie, okay? But soul ties can also come from an unhealthy or an ungodly affection, love, or lust. I prayed for so many people that had an abusive father or mother or relative. They loved them but the relationship was unhealthy. And so I began to break ungodly soul ties by the name of their mom, by the name of their dad, by the name of their grandparents, by the name of whoever. It's not the fact that they were necessarily abused. It's the fact that there was an ungodly... I've had people that never had a relationship with person X, but so 
loved them or lusted after them or wanted so bad to be in their life that just that emotional connection to them, though they'd never been physically together, that emotional connection was enough for the devil to make a soul tie. Because what is a soul? Mind, will, and emotions. So you can have an ungodly emotional connection to another person. Do you have that photo up there? Would you put that up, please? I teach this in, in, in premarital. For the sake of argument, say that the lady in blue is you, okay? If, if you're a male, then it's not you, but it's the male version of you. Okay, so when you have, when you have ungodly soul ties with people that you have been with or that has been with you, that soul tie runs through all of them and everybody that they've ever been with. So you can see real quick the spiritual soulish connection to people that you got divorced from, had sexual encounters with, got raped by, whatever, plus all the people they've been with. It's a nasty web that just goes into infinitum. So those are pathways that the enemy has to bring. Watch this. The curses from all those people now have a super highway right into your life. That's why some of you, after you've been with somebody, you'll use words that you never used before. And when you use them, you go, well, that sounds just like so. Why would I ever say that? That's not me. Oh, it is now. You catch what I'm saying? Familiar spirits function in that too. You say, well, that's not my family line. Really? What makes you family? It ain't the piece of paper from the state. You're making a connection that ought not be there with the blessing of God. Then we need to renounce involvement with demonic music or habits. There is an anointing on music. There is an, that's, why, that's why the king called for David to come and play his harp. Why? Not because David was the most skilled. It's because he, he had the anointing of God on his life. So when David played the harp, the presence of, of the Lord showed up. When the presence of the Lord showed up, the devil that was, that was tormenting the king would take a hike. Why? Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Some of you don't yet understand that when you're playing certain music, it summons the devil. You guys remember the, the old uh, uh, the cowboy movies and, and whatnot, and you, you got the, what's, what's the guy's name that makes all the food? No. And he's a cook, but what's he called on the range? Anyway, the guy that makes the beans. Chuck Wagon. He comes out there with a, with a triangle. What does that mean? Grub's ready. When you play certain music that has the anointing of the enemy on it, it rings that bell, says, hey, there's an idiot over here. Curses don't disappear on their own. Whether it's your own words passed down, or here's one that is not often taught in most places, trespassers. What's a trespasser? If I'm praying for Mike and we get in agreement and I break all the anger, rage, murder, and violence off his life, I'm not saying he has it, I'm making him an example. And all of a sudden, man, you see the power of God just hit him, and he's just weeping and rejoicing before the Lord. Man, I feel this good ever. This is so wonderful. I just love this. Okay, great. So get filled with the Holy Spirit. He gets out of here sealed and filled with God. And I'm going, wow, wasn't that awesome? Didn't God just shine right there? Isn't that wonderful? And then I get in a truck, and I go home. And all of a sudden, I go off on my wife or kids uncharacteristically. And I'm going to bed thinking, what just happened? Because the enemy that was on his life, if I don't address it, would love to crawl up on my life 
and go home with me and demonstrate his presence by the way he influences me to behave. Some of y'all say, I just don't believe that that's really the way it works and that that's, that that's just very biblical or, or God. or I've, It's happened too many times. Go home and forget to deal with trespassers, have crazy, whacked out dreams, fights that didn't need to ever happen, people using me as target practice on the, on the interstate, trying to take the front end of my truck off or ram it. Just nonsense. Why? Because I'm, I'm a Velcro mat, uh, magnet for the things of the devil. And when I identify, oh, and I'll say, Father, I thank you today, Lord, for the anointing of my life as I break off every trespasser. Get out of here. I'll take a deep breath, and I'm yawning so big. I'm having to trust God to drive the truck because I'm crying because my yawn is so big. Feeling that stuff go. Now, Holy Spirit, fill me up every crack, every, every vacancy in my life. Fill it up with you. And wouldn't you know it, the storm stops. For those of you that caught any part of this message today online, God bless you. I pray that you found something here that inspires you, that opens your eyes, that maybe makes you want to dig a little bit more. If you're looking for a new church home, we're certainly looking to grow the family of God here at No Excuses Ministries, 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City. Every Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m., every Thursday evening at 6.45 p.m., come be a part. Come a little early for some fellowship and coffee and all the sissy sauces that go with it. We'd love to hug your neck and get to know you. God bless you and have an incredible day.